Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here, although this time of the morning, um, I'm not sure my brain is focused enough to do anything, uh, let alone begin the TED conference. And in fact, what's kind of interesting is when they knew that they were going to have a conductor speaking, they thought, where should we, where should we have this? Um, you know, where's the right place? And so they called Doug King because they figured, we've got a conductor, we need infinite headroom for his ego. <laughs> so the universe works pretty well. Um, the other thing that I thought was really great was that they know that I, you know, spend most of my time on a podium, so they have the largest podium I have ever been on. So this is really great. I have this feeling that there's all of this space that I can deal with. And one of the things about conductors is that they tend to have these kinds of egos. I mean, you've often heard us referred to as maestro, and that seems like it's a really great thing until you suddenly realize that if you can't remember the person's name, maestro sounds really good. And then you suddenly think, wait a minute, they, they just don't know who I am. And then I, you think, okay, I'll turn around, because this is the famous part of me. This is what everybody sees. Now, you think I'm joking. You think that I'm making this up, but I fly a lot. If the airlines are having troubles, it's not because of me. Um, I was once on one of those sort of late-night concerts, really early flight the next morning, and the only way I find to get myself going is with a lot of caffeine. So I was on the flight, and I arrived in St. Louis, and after you've had a great deal of coffee, it's diuretic, so, you know, you need things. There are certain bodily needs you need to take care of, so I rushed straight to the place, and I'm standing there in the stall. <laughs> and suddenly I hear, Oh my God, it's David Robertson! <laughs> And that was the last thing I really wanted to hear right then. You know, so let me finish my business and, you know, I'll wash my hands first, please. So you have this kind of a thing that's going on with conductors. And in fact, you know, people actually make lots of jokes about conductors. There's the one which I, you may have heard, please stop me if this is the case, where the guy goes into the pet store and, you know, he says, I'd like a bird, please. What kind of bird? Well, I'd like a bird that sings really well. Okay, sings really well. Great, we've got this baritone bird over here. Sings all the arias from Rigoletto and from the Tosca and, you know, so how much is that? It's a lot of money. And so, well, you know, I was really thinking of, it's a present for my wife. I'd like to really spend a good deal. So they keep going up, and there's the soprano bird, which is beautiful plumage and looks fantastic. And that bird, you know, is even more expensive, and it can sing. And then finally, sort of, don't you have anything else? Well, you know, there's the tenor bird, sings Nessun Dorma, and it's got all of these things. You know, we call it Pavarotti around the house, and everybody's, oh, what a huge amount of money. So what about the other stuff? Well, you know, is that the most expensive bird? And he says, no, 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 the most expensive bird is that one over there. There's a feather hanging off. It looks absolutely horrific. And so here's this guy, so wait a minute, why? What, what does that bird sing? He says, doesn't sing at all. Really? Why is it so expensive? Well, we don't know, but the other birds all call it maestro. And so this is the thing. <laughs> Nobody actually knows. So when I was suggested, could you have the art of conducting, I thought, it's not the art of conducting, it's much more the art of conducting. What is this? The guy stands up and waves his hand, he doesn't have a musical instrument and he's in front of a whole lot of musicians. This doesn't make sense. I have never had a taxi ride long enough that somebody can say, so what do you do? I'm a conductor. Oh, you stand and wave your arms up in front of the ground. Yeah. Why do you do that? You know, and it's never long enough. Maybe if I took it from, I don't know, New York to San Diego, I'd have enough time to explain. So I'm going to try and do this in a fairly short period of time. And it's actually a kind of funny thing that goes on. It's really about listening. I know this is ironic. It's about listening and leading by listening. You do that because, in fact, you just wave your arms. Now, um, I don't know if they can bring the house lights up here a little bit, because I'd love to be able to look at you while you're doing this. I would like to show you the really highly technical, that's great, the really highly technical stuff that I do every day. First of all, take your arm and put it out in front of you. Now, I, I, calm down, because I know this gets really, really complex. Go up. Right? That's an upbeat. Now, this is the really hard part. Go down. Man, you guys are awesome. <laughs> this is amazing. So now I'd like you to do this with me, sort of once again. So we do, we'll do an upbeat, we'll do a downbeat, and we will keep going. So we do... Bum-ba-dee-da-yum. Bum-bum. 
bum, bum. Man, this is great. You can conduct every waltz there is. You can do this. This is fantastic. Now, I'm not going to do out to the side, because then you'll whack your neighbor, and this is once again why they give me a really big podium. So what's actually happening here? What's happening is that you're sort of showing time. You're showing a schematic of something. And this is where we get into what I actually kind of do, which is that when I'm up, in front of an orchestra, they all have things to play. And they're all really good, amazing musicians. They can do all of these incredible things. Now, probably a number of you here are also thinking, well, that's great, they're professional musicians. I remember when I was in school and I was told by somebody, you have no musical talent. And that's true, I like listening to music, but I really can't do anything like that. And there are probably some people here who would raise their hand if I said anybody do that. I'm not going to embarrass anyone. But what I want to do is this. I'm going to turn around and I'd like you to imagine that you're listening to a cell phone conversation. And the reason I'm turning around is because we communicate all sorts of things and we are extraordinarily sensitive as a species to things that are going on. And I would like you just to actually imagine that you are hearing sort of Bob Newhart-like one voice of a conversation. And so in this conversation, I want you to sort of figure out whether or not you can understand what the person is saying. Really? 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 What you just processed was really musical. The fact that you can understand, that you could have said, well, one of those was incredulous, the other one was slightly annoyed, the other one was actually empathetic and feeling, that you get these immediately, that it is no effort, proves that you're musical. It proves that we are a musical species. It's one of the things that defines us. Small children, when they are in the womb, the ear, the most complex mechanical part of the body, develops very early on. And when, peop when the babies come out, it is really ready to hear all sorts of things. A huge range of frequencies. The pinna on the outside of our ears actually all focus. I mean, I know they look weird, but they actually work like acoustic filters, and they focus and direct certain sounds to us. The reason our ears look like this is so that we can be very attuned to high frequencies, which are often not the things that you hear as the main note, but give you lots of other clues. And these are really good when we're in front, so that the high frequencies from the back of us are less important than the ones from the front, and this helps us figure out things. Sound reaches your head, and this is about 17 um, centimeters in, in length. Sound reaches your head here one six thousandth of a second quicker than it will reach here if it's coming from a sound source on this side. It has to do with the speed of sound. And we process that and we look that way. So we're really good at this. And so when you're a little kid and you're doing this, particularly as brain science has found out that the neuroplasticity that is um, there when you get a chance to actually work with music is vastly improved. The corpus callosum, which is the part that separates the left and right hemispheres, the two parts of our brains that talk to each other and communicate and have different jobs to do, the number of neural connections is vastly improved if kids have on hands musical experience. So the first idea I would really like to kind of leave with you guys, because you're all deciders, is any time somebody talks about music education, could you really go for it? When you think about it, what is it that some little kid who is scratching away at a violin or playing the piano slowly is learning to do? Well, they're learning to focus. And the focus is really good. Now, I know in, in the United States especially, but actually in much of the developed world, we tend to look at education as goal-oriented. It's going to a certain place. You have to get this degree. It is because you want to get the job. I'd like to look at education a little bit differently, as something, as the composer Robert Schumann said, for which there is no end, which goes on your entire life. Your neuroplasticity goes on your entire life. We've found that out. That's great. So here we have 
this small child. They're learning to focus, they're learning to think ahead. They're learning to remember both short-term memory and long-term memory. They're learning to concentrate. They're learning the nature of cause and effect. They're learning all sorts of aspects of control and interaction between the two hands. They're actually building parts of the brain that have to do with the fingers. They get larger when you play this. So now let me ask you, with all of these things that music is teaching kids, why pull it out of the school curriculum? Ah, because it's not going to teach us math and science. Well, hang on just a second, because I, my dad was a scientist, and I'm so delighted to be at the Science Center here that I cannot tell you. But science does one thing really well. It discovers stuff. If there's something out there, the science is going to get it. Think about it this way. If Newton had been sitting under that tree, and it had been a really mother of an apple, and it hit him on the cranium, and unfortunately, kapow, that was the end of Isaac. Somebody else still would have worked out the mechanics. Somebody would have done it. That's the way science goes, because it's out there and we discover it, we find it. The images from the Hubble telescope, it's just fantastic. So we don't see them in the visual, go to the microwave. We've got all of these things, we're going to discover it. Now I'd like you to think about your own personal favorite creative artist. It could be Schubert, it could be Bach, it could be Lennon McCartney. I couldn't care less. Now, imagine a parallel universe where that person never got born. doesn't exist. It's not my idea, it's Milan Kundera's. If you want to read more about it, look at his book, The Curtain. Art is about this kind of personal discovery that only each one of us can have. Both the reception of it, the way we get a work of art, and the way somebody comes up with it. If Schubert had not written that unfinished symphony, we wouldn't have it. We wouldn't have those beautiful melodies. Nobody else is going to write yesterday except the Lennon and McCartney's. That's the extraordinary thing about how this works. So, how do I fit into all of this? What is the art of conducting? Well, I've shown you a little bit of the movement, but think about this for a moment. And this is the second thing, this leading by listening. I get up and I have no instrument. This is really ironic. It's a pretty good gig. I can't make a mistake. Actually, I can make a mistake. One of the things that I can do is not to properly interact with people. One of the interactions, if you're playing a melody, you've got something to hold on to. But if you're waiting to come in, then all of a sudden the schematic diagram of what's happening with the music is really, really important. But there's another part that's even more important. And once I tell you this, I will have to kill you so that you don't tell anyone else. In conducting classes, they will tell you that people look up before they're going to come in. This would seem fairly obvious. And in fact, this is your moment to get really pertinent information through. If you want a phrase played a certain way, that's great. It's like the paper boy. The window happens to be up at this point. You throw the paper in and psh, it's right in front of the ottoman. And everybody goes, wow, this is great. <gasps> you know, and then they look at the news and they throw that out the window again. If the window is closed, you're paying for the pane of glass. So you need to get the information in at the right time. You have in front of you a group of experts. They are the best at what they do. The clarinetist knows how to play the clarinet better than anything else. I come in as the expert of knowing the entire score. So when that person looks up at me, they are bringing all of their expertise from years of playing into how they're going to fashion that solo that, let's say, Beethoven or Bartok or Stravinsky has put on the page. So I give them some information. Now, this is what I've never heard in a conducting class. Everybody looks up slightly differently. You guys work with people all the time. This shouldn't surprise you. But what that means for a conductor is, Everybody's window is going up at a different time in the papers. You have to remember this person's window goes up one bar before they play. This person's window goes up just the second before they play. And that's when you have to throw the information in. So when you come in front of a new orchestra, your first five minutes need to be gathering all of this information. It's a lot to do. But then, on top of this, almost everybody looks up, and I think much of this is unconscious, looks up at the end to check. Oh yeah, I'm in the right place. Yeah, this is fine. I can, 
I can do this. And that's the moment where if somebody, let's say this clarinetist, has played an amazing phrase, unlike one that he's ever done before, and he looks up, not even thinking that he's looking up at you, and sees you looking back and going, wow, that was amazing. That's fantastic. And so there's this kind of interaction. The other thing that's great about an orchestra is that through this listening, you're listening to potential. And because, as I showed you earlier on, talked about, everybody's so good at reacting, we're capable of a hundred individuals all suddenly acting like one unit in a second to change because they hear something and immediately they're instinctive. And if I process that information and send it out in a gesture, all of a sudden, a place in the score where we have never taken time before, we expand. So all of this stuff is going on in an orchestra, all of this immense creativity, and the conductor actually ends up being kind of like a network center where all of this comes through and passes between the musicians, through you, and then out to the audience. And in a weird way, you're not doing anything. You're just making sure that the channels of communication are really clear. So that's kind of what the art of conducting is about, is this listening to potential, this leading through listening to potential. And this is great, you may be able to apply some of this, but you're probably thinking, why should I care about an orchestra? That's not actually the kind of music I like to listen to. Well, let me leave you with this. In my own personal orchestra, we have people from all over the world, different nationalities, genders, belief systems, all of that. But even more, they play instruments that do not look and sound alike, that have different histories and backgrounds and completely different techniques of being played. A double bass, a xylophone, and a piccolo? Come on, you can't re reconcile that kind of diversity, and yet, Obviously, this is what we do at concerts, and this is what we go for. We live in a society where tweeters and bloggers and the internet and 24-hour news cycles can let us know of calamities around the world that show just how awful a species we really are. So let me leave you with this. The next time your soul sinks, assailed by some yet new barrage of proof of man's inhumanity to man, Remember the symphony orchestra, which stands as a hugely powerful and unshakable metaphor for the fact that the things which unite us and allow us to work together to create an amazing, beautiful society are far, far stronger than all of these things which would seem to pull us apart. Thank you very much.